this morning, but I'm almost afraid you're going to answer me, so I'm going to answer it rhetorically, okay? Don't give me an answer. But what did you give your mothers for Mother's Day? What did, you know, what, what did you think about on Mother's Day? Did you, did you do something? Did you send flowers? Did you bake a cake? Did you just say, I'm going to go see my mother? You know, Mother's Day is a day where you do something for your mother. When I, when I, start, when I was growing up, went to college, um, I was 700 miles away from my mother, and my Mother's Day gift that began while I was in college and lasted until the day that my mother passed away, on Mother's Day, I always called her collect. I would pick up the phone and dial her landline, but I always made it reverse the charges, and I just loved hearing her voice when the operator would say, you have a collect call from Steve Brown, and she would say something like this, I guess so. (laughs) Will you accept the charges? Can I think about it? I mean, she told, she told one operator, can I think about it? And the lady just kind of went quiet on the other end. It was kind of like, I don't, this is not, this is not good, <laughs> you know. Collect call from your son. Will you accept the charges? Well, I guess so. Well, can I think about it? But that was always between my mother and I. My mother and I would think that I did not love her if I did not call her on Mother's Day, collect. One day, she actually came here to worship on Mother's Day, and I waited till she go, went all the way back to Columbia and then picked up the phone and called her collect to wish her a happy Mother's Day. That was just our thing. But if your mother or your adopted family was a king, we just sang it, I have absolutely nothing fit for a king except my alleluia or my praise. I'm going to tell several stories this morning, and I want you to bear with me. We're going to get to the Scripture in just a few moments, but I want to try to put this Scripture in a context of of some stories that just come from my life. It's kind of my testimony, I think, that at every church that I've pastored, I've adopted some people. I've adopted some children, and I want you to hear some of their stories and hear their names and several of them, if not all of the men that I'm mentioning today, are going to be watching this service at some point or another. And I, and I want to, to mention to them how important it was that they gave me the privilege to adopt them. In the very first church that I pastored, I adopted three specific people that I want to mention to you. Two of them were brothers and sister. Their names were Gretchen and Benji Bear. Gretchen and Benji Bear, Gretchen was 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 just a little bit older than Heather and kind of became her buddy in church, sat with her and did all of those things. And Benji had a hard time coming into the world. As he came into the world, his lungs had not developed entirely. And there were some questions about whether he was going to be able to, to function real and all that kind of stuff. And, and I just fell in love with Benji. And Benji, Benji was one of those kids that kind of kept me on, on cue. We, we, we had a, a parsonage across the street. And one day between Sunday school and church, I took Benji over there to show him a train that I had set up. And for a few minutes before the worship service, we played with that train and we ran the train around. And when we came into the worship service that morning, I was going to have a moment of silence because I thought that the service just called on the fact that we needed to have a quiet moment. And so I asked everybody to bow their heads and to close their eyes. And, and in the middle of that silent moment, I heard Benji go, And I thought, that's my boy. One Sunday after church, I stooped down to talk to Benji because he was short. Little guy. And when I stooped down, he stooped down with me and got even lower. And those, that's what I remember about Benji. But to this day, I've adopted them. Misty Kaiser is another that I adopted from that first church. And, and Misty was the, the daughter of my secretary at that first church, a lady who I love dearly. And uh, I love Larry and, and Vicki with all of my heart. But Misty was just, she grew up in our church. And, and, and when we went our separate ways, I thought, well, we've gone our separate ways. But even just this past year, we were at a University of South Carolina football game. And, and somebody realized that we were there Misty's mother realized we were there and she said well Misty's at the game too and so she texted Misty and Misty then in turn texted me and said where are you and we were as far away from each other as we humanly possibly could be 
And she said, I'll be there in a minute. Well, it was about 20 minutes because it took her a long time to get from where she was seated to where we were. And there we hugged, we embraced, and I was so thankful that I could call her my daughter. The second church I pastored, there, there are some names that I would mention to you of, of some people. One of them would be April, April Aarons, who to this day, April Hathaway now, who is very much a part of our, of our church here at North River. She watches our service. She contributes to our church. And, and she was just one of those youth that I could talk to. Heather and Holly Bounds, they're just like children to me. And I watched them on Facebook, and I watched them grow up, and they gave me the privilege of, of a being a part of their lives. The third church I pastored, I, I have to mention two. I would mention Brandy, who used to be Brandy Arrington, now Brandy Fralick. She just got married not too long ago. And I'd also mention Paisley Polk, who's now Paisley Elliott. Paisley came to our house. Uh, she met my daughter at school. She wasn't a part of the First Baptist Church. She, was, she met my daughter at school, and Heather being new to that school, they kind of buddied up. And I, had, I gave Heather some tickets. She got some tickets to go to. And please don't tell this, on, tell this to anybody. This is my secret. But I gave my daughter tickets to go see Atlantis Morissette. And, and she only, she, she, her mother was going to go with her, but she needed a friend. And so she asked Paisley, can, can you go to see the, uh, go to the Atlanta Morissette concert with me? And her mother called me to find out if I was really the pastor at the church. And I said, yes, ma'am, I'm the pastor at the church. And she said, and, and you're, you're letting your daughter go to Atlanta Morissette concert. And I said, yes, I am. And she said, I can remember this day. She said, well, I guess it'll be okay for Paisley to go too. And she let Paisley go. I baptized Paisley. Paisley became daughter number four to me very quickly. She was just, she's just one of the loves of my life. She allowed me to adopt her. And here, here, gosh, I just can't stop naming names. I mean, I look at Matt and Crenshaw and Sean and Ethan and, you know, Ethan's my newest adoption. Uh, raise your hand, Ethan, so they'll know who you are. Uh, he, he's my newest adopted son. Uh, hopefully that's going to be a long-term relationship, but that's really up to him at this point. Angela, you know, the, these kids that, that God allows to come into your life and, and you, you, you build a connection. Now understand why I'm telling these stories. These stories required something to take place. It, it required a choice that I made, but oh, go ahead and applause for Sean if you'd like to. Thank you for interrupting my sermon, Sean. It's okay. Since you're my adopted son, you can get by with it this time, okay? This idea that someone chooses and that the other person allows it. Understand what I mean by that? You choose and someone else has to allow it. Someone else has to accept it. Someone, you don't just adopt somebody and that person say, you know, I really don't want to be adopted, but I'll go anyway. That's not how that works. When you adopt a child, there's, there's that process where that child has to meet you. You've got to meet them. they gotta, they got to feel a comfortableness about you. They've got to feel that, that, that it's a good thing that they're allowing them to be a part of your life. You understand what I mean? They, they accept that. They acknowledge that. They reverse the adoption. You choose, but they allow it to happen. Now read with me from, first, uh, from Ephesians chapter 1. We're going re to read verse 5. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intentions of his will. He predestined us to adoption. Now let's, uh, we need to get word, we need to get that word predestined out of the way, okay? That's a hang up for a lot of us. A lot of people have a real complex problem with the word predestined. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you that if you believe something about predestination, it's because you grew up believing that about predestination. There, there are two thoughts about predestination, and you don't have to stay in either one of those camps, folks. There are folks who believe that predestined means that before anything began, God chose the people that he was going to save and chose the people that he was not going to save. 
All right? That's Calvinism pretty much at its, at its extreme there. That God predestined. So none of us become a part of the family of God unless it has been predestined for that to happen. I have a view, another viewpoint on predestination. I believe that predestination means that from the very beginning, God had a plan. That God predestined a plan, and that as you and I respond to that plan, it determines where it determines our destination. It's not that God determined that Courtney or Jim or Crenshaw were going to be saved beforehand. It's that He understood that I'm going to offer a plan of salvation, and that I'm going to limit my knowledge as to who chooses that and who, who receives it and who doesn't. Okay, understand what I mean by that. that. That there's a will of God for your life. And if you choose that, you have a free choice. God gave you a free will. And if you choose that, He knows the destination. But He also knows that if you reject that or you don't choose that, He also knows what's going to happen. So everyone has two courses in their life, that that's inside the will of God and that that's going to be outside the will of God. You've heard me explain it this way over and over again, and I'll explain it again today. You choose in this life whether you're going to allow yourself to be adopted. God says, I want to adopt everyone. I choose to adopt everyone. It is predestined that I want to choose everyone. However, I offer that, but they must be willing to receive. They must be willing to accept. So in my life, we, we talked about it a few moments ago. It says that he picks us up and he turns us around. Did you hear that in, that you were singing a little while ago? He picks us up and turns us around. Every one of us at some point in our life are no longer in God's grace. Now, up until an age of accountability, we talk about that age when someone is old enough to make these decisions. But there's a point where every one of us turn our backs on God. If this is God, we turn our backs on God and we begin to live in a sinful way. Sinful does not mean the things that we do. Sinful means that we've turned our back on God. Sinful means that we've become disobedient. Sinful means that we don't acknowledge. Sinful means that we have, we're moving away from God. And as we move away from God, God gives us all of these opportunities to allow ourselves to be adopted. Okay, I understand what I'm saying by that. Every now and then he puts something right in the way and says, hey, I want you. I want you to be a part of my family. I choose you. I chose you a long time ago. What are you going to do about it? Now understand that. I chose you, but I'm not going to make you become a part of my family. How would you, have, you, have you ever tried to force somebody to become a part of your family? Just doesn't work so well, does it? That they will rebel against that. They'll reject that. They will be adamantly opposed to that. You cannot. But, but there are times when you invite people to become a part of your family and they just willingly draw right into it. That's what God does. God says, I'm calling you. I predestined you. I'm calling you. I'm choosing you. I want to adopt you. Okay. I used to, to know some folks that had been adopted by their families, and they, they often would say something like this to me. You didn't get a choice of who your mama was going to be, but I had a choice. That, that your mama didn't get a choice of you either, but my mama chose me. What would it be like, what would it be like if mamas had a choice to say, no, I don't want that one. It happens. We know that that's a reality. Do we not? There are a lot of times when mothers even give birth to children and say, I'm going to put the child up for adoption. I don't want that child. Or I can't take care of that child. Or whatever other circumstances are be there. And then someone comes along and says, but I will accept that child. I will adopt that child. What a beautiful story. And that person does has an edge on most of us, don't they? My mama came and picked me out of the bunch. My mama came and chose me. My mama looked at me and said, I want her or I want him. That daddy came and said, I am in agreement. I want her or I want him. That's what God does for us. God has come and already said, I've already determined that I want you. 
that it's been determined that I want all of you. It's predestined that I want all of you to be a part of my family. However, you have to accept or willing to become a part of the family. I will not force you into my family. I will call you into my family. So when it says he predestined us, yes, he predestined all of us to be a part of the family. But there has to be that point where we get up or we're lifted up or we come into some invitation to receive Christ or some invitation to turn around. He picks us up. He turns us around and we start walking back towards God. Life is at its best 80 years and, and the Scripture teaches us that in our 80 years or 90 years or even 100 years that we live, that as long as we're on this planet, we have this choice that we need to make. Are we going to move towards God or are we going to move away from God? And over and over again, as we're moving this direction, God reminds us, He invites us, He says, don't go that direction, get up and turn around. Now, you've heard the story, so have I. The, the man's driving down the road, and he comes across this sign that says, bridge out one mile. And he says, I don't think so, and just keeps driving. He's made a decision at that point, has he not? Then he comes across a guy that's standing in the middle of the road, and he's going, don't go. The bridge is out. The bridge is out. And he says, I don't believe it. And he goes right around the guy and just keeps on going is it predestined? Is it predestined that he's going to fall off the bridge? Well, he may stop before he gets there, but he sure hadn't stopped yet, has he? It still hasn't. It still hasn't reversed him at all. He's going there, and maybe he's going at ninety miles an hour, and has no choice at the very last minute. He's going to drive off the bridge, but he can't say, "I wasn't warned. I wasn't told to turn around." As we move away from God, we know that death is on this side, and we know that death is on this side, and we choose which direction we're going to go, and there's warning after warning and invitation, and there's this compelling that God says, I want to adopt you. I want to choose you. I want you to be, I, although you're flawed, I want to cover your flaws with my blood. I want to cover your flaws with my grace, and I want you to become a part of my family. And we blow by it, and we blow by it, and we blow by it. But every now and then, he picks us up. Gosh, isn't that a wonderful thing when you watch a child that, that wants to be picked up by you, and they come, and and you pick them up, and they just squeal when that happens. One of my favorite adoption stories here at North River is when Lily Leitner was a small child. I was there the day that Lily Leitner was born. I was one of the first people that held Lily Leitner outside of her own parents. And I loved it when Lily Leitner would open that back door when she was a toddler, and I could hear her screaming, Pasto Steve, as she would come in the door. And wherever I was in the building, I stopped what I was doing, and I always went to her because she was looking for me, and I was looking for her, and I would pick her up. To this day, one of my favorite pictures is holding Lily Leitner in one arm and Trinley Leitner in the other arm, and they're both doing this to me. You know, they're part of the family. I chose them, and they accepted my choosing. And they chose me about as much as I chose them. God chooses us. It's been predetermined that God would choose you. But it's not that you are going to automatically receive Christ. God waits for your decision. God waits to see if you will allow that adoption to go through. In preparing this sermon, I watched a YouTube video that showed a, a teenage daughter who, uh, who had been taken a mixed marriage, I guess, a marriage where the, uh, there had been a divorce and her mother and she had become a part of this man's life. And she had been in this man's life for a little bit of time. And, and, and on a certain day, he, she gave him an invitation to adopt her. He opened up a package and inside that package was her invitation will you adopt me? Because they had made a choice that he willingly wanted that to happen, but it wouldn't happen until she allowed it or agreed to it. 
And this big burly man burst into tears as he embraced the one who was allowing him to adopt her. That's what God does to us. God says, it's predetermined that I want to adopt all of you. It's predetermined that I'm going to give you the invitation. It's predetermined that I'm going to warn you. It's predetermined that I'm going to try to turn you around as many times. It's not forced upon us. It's that invitation. It's that inviting. It's don't go this way. Come here. It's that I want you to be a part of my family. And then we have to choose to allow that. But the rewards are great. What does he adopt us to? As redheaded stepchildren. He doesn't treat us like the rest of the family. Have you heard adopted children sometimes say they don't treat us like the rest of the family? What does he say? He adopted us as sons. He adopted us as his own child. It's important that we understand that. That we who choose to accept that have been given the exact same position as everyone else in the Bible who are referred to as the sons of God. Now, sometimes we're going to say, well, he only had one son. Well, the Old Testament refers to the sons of God in several different places. There are others that God created and called sons of God. And and we need to understand that. But he puts me on equal par as to the only begotten son. Did Steve Brown just claim to be equal with Jesus? No. In the eyes of God, does God the Father treat me as he also treats his son? Yes. Is there a more honored place or is there something that God offers to Jesus that he doesn't offer to all of those who are adopted? What does he say? You become joint heirs with Jesus. That means everything that he gets, you get to. All the wonders that Christ has, you get to. All the rewards, all the glory, everything that God has imposed upon Jesus, he will impose upon his adopted children because we are joint heirs with Jesus, not sub-heirs, not sub-inheritors, not getting less than, not just really part of the family, but I love these churches that have this category in their church membership. You can be in full membership and you can also be in part membership. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, folks. Is there ever such a place where we get to be part members of the kingdom? Not full members, but just a part member? In other words, instead of getting a full crown, I only get a half a crown? Or because the rewards that God gives to those who are full members of the kingdom, they get more than those who are just partial members of the kingdom. There's no such thing. You either are or you aren't. And if you are, all the benefits of the kingdom are placed upon the sons of God, the children of God, all who are part of the family. Now understand what that means. That means that I can be as wicked as Steve Carroll over there and still be a part of the family of God. It means that my life can be terribly wrong in this world and still be a part of the family of God. Do you remember that story about that son? One of the most famous stories in the Bible about a son Give me my inheritance, and I will do with it as I please. And so the son says to the dad, give me my stuff. The dad gives him his stuff. He goes to a far-off land. He spends all of his money, as the Scripture says, on riotous living. And next thing you know, he's feeding pigs in a pig pen. Great job for a Jewish boy, huh? Pigs being the most filthy animal. And the Scripture says that not only did he feed the pigs, but he desired to eat the slop that they were feeding the pigs, except nobody would give it to him. That the owner of the pigs thought the pigs were more important than the guy feeding the pigs. He never offered him food. He never offered him what he needed. He desired to eat the slop that the pigs were eating, but nobody would give it to him. And he came to his senses and said, 
In my Father's house, listen to the text, in my Father's house, there are hired servants that live better than I do. So I will not go back to my father and ask him to take me back as his son. I will ask him to hire me as a servant just so that I can live in the house again. Had it been predetermined that the father would love him if he came back home? You bet. I believe that father loved his son with all of its heart, with all of everything that he had. I think he missed his son. I think he loved his son. And when his son came to his senses and said, I'm going back home. Now, you know what happened to that boy. All the way back home, he's saying to himself, I'm going to have to face him. And he's going to tell me. He's going to say, I told you so. First thing he's going to say is, how's the pig business doing? I thought you were going to be rich by now. Look at you. You're filthy. You stink. You've been among pigs. Oh, in the mind of that boy, that's how he thought himself as he was going to be accepted by his father, that he would have to say to his father, I'm not your son any longer. What I want to be is a hired servant. But the Scripture says that the father adopted him back into the family. That when the boy was still afar off, he left the porch, went and gathered to the, to the son, went to the son, embraced the son. That must have been a real smell, wouldn't you think? That boy feeding pigs. Embraced the boy. Said to his servants, go get a ring, put it on his finger. What did that mean? He means he's part of the family. Put a ring on his, fi- on his finger. He is mine. I'm inviting him back into the family. Go get a robe, clean him up, give him a bath. Go get a fatted calf. We're going to have a party tonight because my son, who is lost, has come home. Wow. When we come to the place in our lives and we want to accept it, God's already predetermined that he'll accept you. When we come to the place in our lives when we're willing to accept what God's done for us, God's already determined, that's okay, I'll accept him. Well, what if they've done all these bad things? That's okay, I'll still accept them. What if they've been horrendously terrible? That's okay, I'll still accept them. What if they've been out there feeding pigs? That's okay, I'll still accept them. No matter how my children come to me, it's predetermined that I will accept them. I will adopt them. I will choose them. There's a story told about some backpackers moving through some of the hill country up in the Appalachian area, and they came across a a cabin where a young man was sitting on the porch and they realized that the young man had some mental disabilities. And they were Christian men and they always wanted to try to leave something with everybody that they met, uh, their, their testimony. And they began to teach this young man, the Lord is my shepherd. And, and to get him to do that, they had him hold his hand up and say, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. And finally, out of repetition, the little guy could repeat, the Lord is my shepherd. And they went on their way. When they came back to the cabin on their return trip, they didn't see the guy sitting on the porch like they had left him, but they began to ask, what about our friend? And the mother sat down on the rocking chair and began to tell the story. Not too long after you left, he wandered off into the woods. We lost him for several days, couldn't find him. And when we found his body, He had come to a a cliff and had fallen off the cliff. And they began to say, oh, what's so terrible. And they began to say, you know, when we were here, we were teaching him, the Lord is my shepherd. And she burst out in tears. She said, that explains it. And she said, what does it, we don't understand. When we found his body, he was clenching on to the ring finger of his left hand. The Lord is my shepherd. Mine. That reality had become his reality. Let me change it just for a moment. The Lord is my father. The Lord is my father. The Lord is my father. But somewhere I have to make that reality and say genuinely he is my father. 
I allow him to be my father. I want him to be my father. I choose him to be my father. Folks, accepting Christ is not an emotional response. It's a will. It's an exercise of the will. It's something I choose to believe. I choose to believe that God has adopted me. I choose to believe that I have allowed him to do so. I choose to believe that he has turned me around. I choose to believe that if I die, I'm going to go to heaven. I don't have to philosophize that, and I can philosophize with the best of you. If you want to get philosophical, we can get very philosophical. But when we get philosophical, we lose sometimes the very basic, simple truth. What did Paul say? I've come down off your mountain, and I've seen all of your gods that you've got statues for, but I want to proclaim to you the one that says the unknown God. I want to tell you about the father you don't know. I want to tell you the one who's predestined to adopt you. I want to tell you the one that's inviting you to be a part of his family. And if you choose, he can be your father. This morning, as you, as you hear that, we, we have allowed the world to convince us all kinds of things, and we're becoming less and less responsive to that good news. Generation after generation is beginning to move further and further away from the simple truth that God loves us and wants us to be a part of his family. Philosophically, we have moved away from that. Those who tell that story are often called foolish and seen by the world as ignorant. We have, we have allowed ourselves to convince ourselves that there's no such thing as God. But you know what? I just choose to believe it. Not because I have to, but because I want to. Not because it's forced upon me, but because I have chosen it myself. It's my story. Just as I've accepted so many different people in my journey as being my children, God has accepted me, and I have accepted him to be his child. Why? Because it was the kind intention of his will. It was God's kindness, not his wrath, not his destruction, not warning us about hell. It was a kind thing that God did when he said, I want you to be a part of my family. I used to say that when I get old, and I'm in a wheelchair in a nursing home somewhere and wrapped up with a blanket and, you know, just being old, I guess, that I would hope and pray that somebody in my ministry would stop by one day and say, you know, you made all the difference in my life. On so-and-so day, you did something. It impacted my life. But I've, I've changed that. I want my children to come see me. Not just my three daughters, but I want to see all my children. I want that, that, that as I get older, I want to remember those people that I adopted into my family who allowed me to adopt them into my family. And I think that as I get old, I just want to, I just want to be assured that they're there. Have you understood how heaven's described? Heaven's described as a big place where we party. If you're Baptist, you're going to be uncomfortable in heaven, particularly if you're anti-everything, because everything you're anti is what we're going to do in heaven. We're going to eat, we're going to drink, we're going to dance, we're going to sing, we're going to rejoice. That's what heaven is. And one by one, people of the family show up. One by one, all of God's adopted children get together, and what's the very first thing they do? They say, thank you to the Father. You chose me, you adopted me, and I am so glad that I allowed it to happen. Father, remind us today that what we talk about is not just circumstantial, it's reality. That when we talk about you being our Father, it's not just something that we've been taught, that someone else taught, that someone else taught, that someone else taught, but it's the reality of our situation that we who choose can allow you to be our Father. 
And we can proclaim that and we can say that and we can accept it with a sense of assurance because Paul tells us that from the very beginning, God predetermined to invite all of us to be a part of his family. And for those of us who allow that to happen, we celebrate that relationship. We pray, Father, that we would begin to enjoy that today. To realize that even in this world that is so chaotic and it seems like God doesn't love us, he's still calling us. He's still inviting us. He's still accepting us. He's still adopting. And for those who hear that call and respond, what a wonderful day that is. For we pray it in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.